but nobody ever asked what the definition of a farm was. And the definition of a farm that's still being used is a 1974 definition that USDA adopted, which is any place that produces $1,000 in gross sales or would have produced $1,000 in gross sales had it maximized its full production capacity. <laughs> now, when you break that down and you start to look at how many farmers we have who are producing the majority of our food, 75% of our food today is being produced by just 192,442 farms in this country. And 30% of our farmers are over age 65 and only 5% are under age 35. Now, you don't have to push those trends very far into the future before we're going to have to really take seriously about where in the hell our farmers are going to come from to produce our food. So these are all some of the unintended consequences that, that have happened. And then in addition to that, we've got, in addition to these natural resources, which we're depleting, we're also uh, uh, seriously damaging uh, the health uh, of our ecology. Uh, you all have read about the dead zones. The estimates now are that there are probably about a thousand of these across the planet. Uh, we had uh, pushed all of our greenhouse gases into the environment, which of course is affecting climate. So we get this more unstable climate. The one thing that climatologists have virtually agreed on is we're going to have more unstable climates in the future, more droughts, more floods, more severe weather events. Now, every farmer in this audience knows that's a resource <laughs> that's critical. You can't come up with all the technologies to solve all of the weather-related issues. And uh, so those are a problem that we're going to... And then, of course, we're starting now to be finally begin to recognize the impact that this kind of approach to agriculture and seeing food as a thing in this way is having on our human health. Uh, now, it's not that all of our human health problems are related to diet, but many of them, like obesity and diabetes, clearly are. Uh, and just to give you, again, a little bit of a sense of where we are here, in 2007, uh, the United States Congressional Budget Office uh, did an analysis to try to determine what our health care costs would be if our health care costs continue to increase into the future the way they have for the past 20 years. And what they concluded was that if we continue on this trend, then by 2080, we will be consuming half of our GDP uh, for our health care costs. Obviously, again, that's not a sustainable future. Uh, and then, of course, there's the problem uh, of uh, food waste in all of this. As I said, according to some estimates, we're producing 4,600 calories of food uh, for every man, woman, and child on the planet every day, but we're only consuming about 2,000 of those calories. Um, so approximately uh, uh, 2,400 calories uh, are being wasted. So if we were to redesign our food system, think about food more as a relationship and figure out where that waste is happening and make sure that that comes into you know, our capacity to, uh, to consume food, uh, we would not only solve our hunger problem today, uh, but we'd be in a position to feed those 9 billion people that we're projecting uh, we'll have uh, by uh, 2050. So, um, so, so this, uh, this kind of is the picture that we're looking at in terms of Conceiving of food simply as a thing, as a commodity, uh, this, is, uh, this is the direction that we've taken. So, what do we need to do? What's the good news? What's, what's the possibility? And of course, that's what all of you here are about, and many groups like you all across this country. And, and what we need, of course, when you think about it in this day, and it's very clear that what we need is a paradigm shift. This isn't a matter of simply tweaking the current system a little bit. You know, we've got to get past this language of greening. All we got to do is green things up a little bit, and then we'll be okay. You know, change your light bulbs, get a more fuel efficient car. Um, in the first place, you know, William Jevons, already back in the uh, in the mid 1800s, uh, was an economist, demonstrated back then that efficiencies don't uh, lower energy consumption. Uh, and he did this in, in relationship with coal. You know, when we invented the new, more efficient uh, uh, steam engines, everybody thought, well, this is great. Uh, because now we're going to use less coal because we've got these more efficient steam engines and therefore our coal reserves, especially in places like Great Britain where they were already drawing down their coal reserves, are going to last much longer. And when Jevons actually did the numbers, he found exactly the opposite. In fact, we were using more coal. And if you think about this, you know, you get a, you get a Prius that gets 45 miles to the gallon instead of what you had before is 20 miles. You say, well, you're going to save a lot of fuel. What you end up doing is driving more because it's cheaper, right? <laughs> And, and, and we're seeing that, you know, that play itself out. So this notion of some kind of steady state sustainability, where 
what we do is take a look at the present system and try and figure out how we can make it more efficient and, 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 and get it operating better uh, is, uh, is, uh, is not going to do it. What we have to think about is redesigning systems. And um, so the good news is uh, that this is already happening. And I'm already running out of time here, so I'm going to have to do this really quickly. What I'm going to do is give you just a few examples from each of these areas, from the, the social, uh, the, so, the, the, biolog the social, the <coughs> ecological, and the, and the economic. One of the things that we're seeing happening in our economic system is that we're starting to recognize that this notion of an economy that operates on the basis of domination, you know, where everybody's on their own, they're going to get theirs, and everybody else is going to get theirs to sell, is really becoming increasingly dysfunctional. And that what's working much better from an economic perspective, more econo better economic performance, is economies <coughs> that are working on the basis of partnership rather than domination. Let me give you one quick example of that. There's a group of farmers out on the West Coast uh, that grow uh, a particular variety of wheat. It's a, it's a high quality of wheat. And uh, it's a group of farmers that have networked together into a marketing network. They're not a formal cooperative because for some reason for them, cooperative doesn't, they didn't like that. So they formed an LLC instead. And there are now 33 farmers that pool their product. And they sell their product to a group of millers who mill that wheat and flour, and then on to the bakers, who of course bake these wonderful baked products. But here's the interesting thing about them. They don't conceive themselves as a typical supply chain, where everybody competes with everybody else. In a typical supply chain, the millers would want the wheat from the farmers as cheaply as possible, the bakers would want it from the millers, the flour from the millers as cheaply as possible, everybody would compete with everybody else. What the Shepherd's Brain Grain Group does is they get together before the farmers ever plant their wheat in the next growing cycle. And with the help of an extension specialist from Washington State University, they determine what the cost of producing wheat is going to be for the farmers in that growing season. Then they take that number and they add to that a reasonable return for investment and labor to the farmer, and then that's the price per bushel of wheat that they guarantee to the farmer, regardless what happens in the marketplace. Now, I've had a chance to talk with the farmers, I've had a chance to talk with the millers, I've had a chance to talk with the bakers, and they all tell me exactly the same thing. They say, we can't believe everybody doesn't do business this way, it just makes sense. And it does, because the farmers have that guarantee, they know that their costs are winning, they can devote their energies and their efforts to producing the best quality of wheat they possibly can in order to get that quality of, of the baking fruits into that consumer uh, that they care about. And the millers don't have to spend money going out looking for that product. They know that the farmers are there for them and are going to guarantee that product for them. And the bakers love it because their sales are exploding. Not only because of the quality of the product, but because the consumers love the fact that the farmers are being treated fairly and treated as partners. So why can't we all do business that way? That's part of the thing we have to think about for the future. 